On the occasion of Black History Month, we are celebrating one of the most important African-American cultural contributions in its world capital, Chicago, the blues. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome Billy Branch, three-time Grammy nominee, Emmy Award winner, and the list goes on, including numerous humanitarian and achievement awards, but most importantly, one of the true living blues giants and probably the finest, smartest, and most virtuoso who has ever played the harp. Thank you for joining me for this talk, Billy. Well, thank you for such a uh, wonderful introduction. <laughs> Billy, how, how did the harp find you? I first uh, experienced uh, harmonica when I was a youngster, walked into a Woolworths five and dime store, saw it in a display case, and it was almost like a, un, a voice just spoke to me and was telling me I could play it. I purchased it for the price of a dollar and immediately putting it to my mouth, I found I could play uh, folk tunes and Christmas melodies, children's songs, which was looking back was kind of amazing because I never heard anyone play uh, in person before. Mm -hmm. When and how did the blues get you? Well, yeah, I did. I came back from Los Angeles to my birthplace, Chicago, and uh, studied political science. Uh, and during my uh, courses at University of Illinois, uh, of course, there are musicians on like any co typical college campus. And Chicago being the blues capital of the world, the blues was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And one of my best friends on campus happened to be the son of Junior Wells' girlfriend. And Junior Wells, of course, was one of the legendary blues harmonica players. So in addition to us having jam sessions on campus, I found my way into the clubs and Junior Wells' home base was a legendary Teresa's Lounge in which I, I began. And from there, um, it was a net, I discovered the network. There were literally, there were probably between 30 and 40 clubs at that time that featured live blues on a nightly basis. At a certain point, a uh, great Swiss jazz musician and composer who became a dear friend to both of us came into play. Well, George Grunz, uh, as you said, became a mutual friend of ours. Uh, he had us appear at the Berlin Jazz Festival in 1977 as a conglomeration of 15 musicians under the name of the new generation of Chicago blues. And this was our very first gig we had at the Sons of Blues. Actually, looking back, we hadn't even chose that name yet. We were billed as the new generation of Chicago blues, 15 musicians comprising three bands, and also accompanied by a man who I had the honor of playing in his band for six years, Willie Dixon who assumed the MC and patriarchal role. Mm -hmm. And it was really something because uh, to my knowledge, the blues hadn't been presented at the Berlin Jazz Festival, at least not on that level. And it was a resounding, it was very successful. And the, the, uh, the crowds loved it. We loved it because it was our first time ever going to Europe and out of the country. And that was the beginning of the Sons of Blues. With a special song being performed and rapped by Willie Dixon. That's correct. Yes, we premiered the song Tear Down the Berlin Wall, which was written by my friend Lucius Barner, who wrote the lyrics. I, I put the music to it. Uh, he was the same one that took me down to Teresa's mother was Junior Wells' longtime girlfriend. And um, we premiered Tear Down the Berlin Wall and Willie Dixon improvised, basically improvised a rap on it. And that performance is 
available uh, right now on YouTube. There's mm -hmm. a doc, two documentaries, Willie Dixon and the Young Blues Generation and Willie Dixon, I Am the Blues. So, so my very first paid performance is on video. And that's when you became the boss of the Sons of Blues, uh, one of the hardest working blues bands out of Chicago. We, we did. We came back and we kept the unit. Uh, Lurie Bell, who is still one of the finest guitarists and vocalists, was pretty much the, the leader of our group. I mean, I was the leader in name, but Lurie assumed most of the, uh, the vocal and he was just such a dynamic artist. He was actually a prodigy. Uh, the thing that he was 19 years old during, at, that, at that festival and playing like someone well beyond his years. And he's still a phenomenal artist, but uh, yes, we, we maintain the name Sons of Blues and over a period since 1977, the personnel has changed, but I retain the, the name with the mission to have a foot in the past with an eye on the future. You know, we, we are dedicated to maintaining the traditional Chicago blues, but also to be aware of the present and future and incorporating contemporary and world music elements as well. In 1990, a uh, milestone CD for old blues and harmonica aficionados was released, Harp Attack, with three of the greatest old masters of the harmonica, and quoting from the song You Pent for the CD, The New Kid on the Block. Uh, I've heard that Junior Wells famously said, we used to make Billy Branch eat that harmonica. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did say that. Yes, Harp Attack was of course uh, Bruce Eglauer, the uh, owner and uh, the owner and producer of Alligator Records, and this was his con concept. And um, he had assembled Junior Wells, Kerry Bell, and James Cotton, and he's told me this story on several occasions. He said we need a fourth player, harp player, and he told me that they unanimously said, "Get Billy." And to me, that's one of the highest honors, despite the Grammy, nom you know, uh, Grammy nominations, Emmy awards, because these are the guys <laughs> that I really admired and looked up to and learned from. And basically, they used to kick my butt off the stage, or they say, "Cut your head," as we say. Uh, for many years, you know, they uh, were very influential in my playing and. They were almost like gods to me, and the, to come full circle and have them select me to be included on this recording was uh, a high honor. The blues has strong roots in Africa and has become at the same time the roots of almost all the great African-American music forms of the 20th century. The blues has exerted a worldwide influence on pop and art music, and in its basic and seemingly simple form, only 12 bars and three chords, over generations an endless number of stories and feelings have been told and continue to be told. What's the secret behind the blues? Well, I don't know uh, if, if you would say it's a secret uh, behind the blues, and I would even go so far, Bruno, as to say not almost all of America. I, I believe the blues is the roots of all of America's music. I mean, including country, uh, folk, jazz, of course, gospel, pop, rock, uh, funk, rap, hip hop. But I, I think uh, the blues comes, of course, directly from the African-American experience in this country. I would venture to say that the blues could be also uh, called the soundtrack of the African-American 
experience because it comes from struggle, comes from hard times, comes from a lot of pain, but yet in its delivery, it is a celebration, it's a release. And I think that's what makes it so universal because we all know everyone, um, no particular ethnic group has a monopoly on pain and suffering, but it's the way that the blues is, is expressed that seems to appeal to everyone. It's like it's so visceral and it reaches down to the soul. You can feel it. Um, you know, everyone can't relate to classical music or jazz or, you know, different forms of music or punk rock or rap, but the blues, simple, complex, I mean, simple, but complex, but it's, it just speaks to the human condition. And when you hear the blues played, you can't help but tap your feet, you know? And then when you hear that slow, mournful, minor blues and the artist is delivering it with passion and singing it so soulfully, you can't, you just have to say, I feel you, man, you know? However, there seems to be a dynamic within the black community that they think that they don't like the blues. Yes, I, I have been quoted as saying that some black people think they don't like the blues and I'm able to be, bear witness because uh, one thing the Sons of Blues did over the decades is maintain an active presence in the African-American nightclubs as well as on the north side and the more white frequented clubs and many times when we first uh what happened was we we developed some notoriety the word got around because we were good we were undeniably good and when lurie bell was at the height of his powers and we were young and we were fresh and we combined sometimes rhythm and blues with blues they couldn't deny us they couldn't because as you know it, when you listen to music, it's if the artist is good, if the group is good, you have to admit it. You might say, I don't like country music. I don't, but if there's, if the band sounds good, if the singers and the bands, you're going to say, you're going to enjoy it. And same thing with the blues, the pushback in the African-American community partly was because the blues reminded, uh, reminded, people too much of hard times. Go back south, the Jim Crow South, the discrimination, the, the lynching, the horrible brutalities, the, and then take that step further back to slavery. It's like, we don't want to, you know, we want to put that in the past, you know? And um, so it was kind of um, mistakenly uh, sometimes or stereotypically just associated with just completely bad time. But in a broader perspective, it when you look at it as being the roots and the foundation of all of America's music, and the fact that the songs aren't, when you go to a blues concert, you're not gonna be sad. Most of the music is very up-tempo and very uplifting, and it's gonna be a, a night of celebration, a night of partying, a night of enjoyment is going to be good feelings, you know. And sometimes a stereotype was, I don't want to hear that old sad old old man sitting on the porch crying about his baby done left him, you know. But it's more to that. And we were able to convey that without even saying it. It became because we'd go into clubs sometimes and they would roll, I'm telling you, they would literally roll their eyes at us. But after a month, we would have residents. We'd have a weekly gig. We had them. We'd walk in the clubs and they'd say, y'all going to play the blues tonight? Because they couldn't deny it. And so we converted. We kind of bat, we were like, looking back, we were, didn't, weren't aware, but we were on a ministry. And we were baptizing our own people back in the blues.
Billy, there are mm -hmm. about 15 records on the, your own name on mm -hmm. the market, mm -hmm. and you have played on another 300 plus mm -hmm. with some of the greatest blues musicians and beyond. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have. <laughs> um, I've had the op I've had the opportunity to, uh, and I'm very humbled and honored to say that I recorded with some of the greatest uh, Chicago and and other uh, exponents of the blues and and some world music figures as well that ever lived. I mean, just to have been in Willie Dixon's band. Willie Dixon was like uh, what Barry Gordy was to Motown. Willie Dixon was to Chester Records. This is the guy that wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs, which were covered by not only the blues artists, but Elvis Presley, the Rolling Stones, the Doors, Jimi Hendrix, on and on and on. And to have recorded with him and people like Coco Taylor, Johnny Winter, Lou Rawls, uh, Taj Mahal, Kev Moe, uh, so many, and Junior, you know, of course, Harp Attack, and so many more. It's, um, looking back, it was really, you know, wonderful, wonderful thing, wonderful, wonderful experience to have been able to do that. To me personally, one encounter seems special, the Chicago Cantata with George Grunt, uh, an experience which has brought you as far as China. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share some of the memories of this project and well, the cooperation? Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, again, George uh, brought us to Berlin Jazz Festival in our first gig as the Sons of Blues, and we premiered the song Tear Down the Berlin Wall. And then he took me and my former guitarist, Carl Weathersby, as guests with him to China, which was groundbreaking at the time, uh, because I recently visited China twice in the last three years. And the difference is so, uh, such a stark contrast from when we went there. And I, I really am grateful for George uh, to have included us in that package because it was his jazz orchestra at the time, which comprised mostly of a uh, very fine, high-level jazz musicians, but to include the blues showed what an innovator he was um, to have that vision. And it was just a fantastic experience. Uh, one thing that stands out, one memory was that uh, to show you how the contrast in China then and now, we remember when we were playing, someone stood up and started to dance and the security got the nightclub and started clobbering him like, no, you don't do that. Uh, another standout was, which I was unaware in my solo, I, I would go and walk through the audience with a wireless microphone. And I played the melody of Farah Jaka not knowing later when we found out that this was an anthem for some of the, the revolution, which was pretty remarkable because the people cheered, but we were so well received. And you got to bear in mind that was, what was that, 1990? Uh, what, that was when China was very, very close. So this was a historic tour to bring Western music to jazz and the blues, but I would dare say that even though all the musicians were world-class and they played at the, the, the highest level, but it seemed to be when Carl and I played the blues that we got the most enthusiastic response. Again, because those people had the blues. And even though they didn't understand the words, they could discern the meaning. Connected. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
let's now talk about two recent songs. Mm -hmm. You did collaborate on Dave Spector's The Ballad of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Hearing you sing and play the harmonica on this song, it becomes immediately clear that this was not just another song for you. The Ballad of George Floyd, I thought, was an excellent, very poignant song written by my musical friend Dave Spector. And uh, I have said in an interview, in a recent interview, uh, that uh, it resonated because what happened to George Floyd, number one, was a public execution by the state, by law enforcement, by a state employed sanctioned law enforcement officer. And as an African American male in this country, I have experienced numerous encounters with police that technically sh I shouldn't have had. I mean, innocent, for example, being accosted on my way to the go to a gig and being accused of stealing a tire and then a radio and thrown into jail. And practically every African-American male in this country can relate to you similar experiences and some far worse. So when you see that image of the video of this man begging for his life and this officer, uh, just ruthlessly and nonchalantly murdering this man, you, in the back of your mind, you feel that this could be me. This could actually be me. So it hit home, that song hit home. And um, I was very, uh, I jumped at the chance to collaborate on it. And I think it's a very important and I, uh, song, and I think Dave did a superb job of writing. And you have written what is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful and touching songs coming out of Chicago in recent years, going to see Miss Sherry one more time. Yes, I wrote that song um, as tribute to one of Chicago's most illustrious and acclaimed residents, Jerry Oliver, who owned the legendary Palm Tavern nightclub for over 50 years. And the Palm Tavern was a club which was frequented by practically all of Chicago's black celebrities and including some white celebrities, such as Tommy Dorsey and Frank Sinatra were said to have frequented. They said when uh, Joe Lewis won the heavyweight title, he celebrated at the Palm Tavern. And um, this was during its heyday. I mean, Billy Holiday, Duke Ellington, Miles David, you name it. They were all, they said that you'd go to the Palm Tavern just to see who was gonna show up. And when I met Jerry, it wasn't until, matter of fact, it was shortly after we returned from the uh, Berlin Jazz Festival. It was around that period, so it would have been in the, around the late 70s. This was way past its heyday, but I discovered it and developed a relationship with her. And she used to affection, affectionately refer to me as her son. That's how uh, close, uh, how much I, you know, close I was and got to know her. And uh, unfortunately, the place was unserious, unceremoniously closed and ultimately destroyed. And I felt that it was just such a, there was no monument, there was no celebration, no commemoration. This place had actually been around since the 1930s because she acquired it from another guy by the name of Jim Knight. And uh, it just seemed so sad that this important facet of Chicago history was demolished without any uh, commemoration. And so I was inspired to write that song. And it was, I considered the, the best song I've ever written and the most comprehensive, it was a hard song to write. 
but I was uh, very happy to be able to let her hear that song before she passed. And um, I felt that it was a moving tribute to one of Chicago's most important residents. In 1978, uh, you have started the Blues in Schools program. Tell us a bit about this wonderful program. Well, um, I began teaching blues in schools in 1978, as you said, and I've done it in a multitude of capacities. There was uh, first through the Illinois Arts Council, then from another arts-oriented organization called uh, Urban Gateways. And I've done this in Chicago and throughout the country and internationally. And I've done it on many different levels, sometimes it's a performance with my band or as a duo. Sometimes it's a residency in which, maybe a month long residency in which students actually, my whole band participates and all the students will learn harmonica. Some students will learn the respective instruments, guitar, bass, piano, drums, and it would culminate in performances by the students. And they learn the history of blues. They learn um, to they learn standard songs, and they learn how to compose original songs. And I will say, over the years, I've had songs so well written that I could have recorded them commercially. And I've had stories that would bring tears to your eyes of the experience of some of these youngsters that were uh, maybe not the best acad students academically, but this program resonated with them and their whole way of relating to teachers and their fellow students changed tremendously. I mean, numerous stories I could tell you. And uh, I've taken this program, uh, I practiced it in Europe, in the mountains of Ecuador, in Canada and Japan. And um, I still, from my very first residency in 1978, some of those former students still come out to the nightclubs to see me. And to me, that's very fulfilling because it shows that they got it. And a, a handful of them went, I, I can cite two or three that became professional successful musicians. But the main thing, um, we had a uh, slogan, which we recite every day. And it, three things, why are we here? To sing and play the blues. What are the blues? The facts of life. What makes the blues so important? There are history, our culture, the roots of America's music. And the most important thing is that these children have a now uh, sound, strong understanding of the significance of the blues. Talking about Roots, your last, most recent CD is Roots and Branches, mm -hmm. the songs of Little Walter. Yes. Why Little Walter? Well, Roots and Branches was a celebration of the, the greatest blues harmonica player that ever lived, Little Walter, Marion Walter Jacobs. Um, it was, uh, Little Walter, of course, was a genius. He was what Charlie Parker and John Coltrane were to sax. He was to harmonica. He innovated. He took the harmonica and uh, took a cheap microphone and distorted it through an amplifier and created this novel sound, making it unrecognizable as the instrument that it was. It sounds more like a horn or something. And we, uh, my wife and I, Rosa, have become friends with little Walter's daughter, Marion, over the years. And she's also featured on the CD, telling, uh, telling short anecdotes about uh, her father when she was a little girl. And it just was time to do something like this. I At first, I kind of pushed back. My wife and Marion were pretty adamant, hey, you got to do this, man. Because my pushback was because there's been so many uh, tributes to Little Walter, but uh, thanks to uh, 
and partially to the musicianship of my band, we came up with a, what I feel is a very novel and dynamic production because about half the album we did uh, in the traditional, the songs we did in the traditional way, and then about the other half we contemporized and added our own personal flavor to it. Last question. Okay. Where is the blues going and where is Billy Branch going with the blues and beyond? Well, today I would say, well, first of all, you can say, you know, and again, uh, the blues is the only music you can say you have. You know, you can't say, I got the jazz. How you feel? I got the jazz. And what the heck are you talking about? But that's another aspect I think that makes it so universal. And it's obvious that the whole world has the blues right now. And, and we don't even have to. It's obvious There's on so many levels, so many dynamics at work right now, of course, the pandemic. And But what I'm seeing now, Bruno, I'm optimistically seeing the entrance of young African-American artists into the fold. And that gives me, especially having been an educator for more than 40 years, gives me calls for, uh, for hope that the blues will perhaps finally be afforded a larger showcase because the blue, blues has been pretty marginalized, almost underground. You don't see it very much on television. You don't hear it very much on primetime radio. You know, you hear it on college stations or you hear it at three in, in the morning when, <laughs> when we're getting off our gigs, you know. But I think that uh, because these young musicians entering the fray, that they may reach some of their peers and maybe they'll be more open to receiving the message of the blues and looking at this in a different light. Uh, I'm hopeful that the blue, I've always been a proponent that the blue should have and enjoy, enjoy more commercial, commercial exposure uh, because, you know, it, it's, it's uh, featured some of the greatest musicians in the world, even in, you know, it's not celebrated on the level of jazz, mm -hmm. but having worked with some of these phenomenal musicians over, over the decades, you know, I, I know the richness of it and I know the essence of it and I recognize the historical and cultural value of it. And so I'm hopeful that it will be enjoyed by a lot more people. And I'm hopeful that uh, I can be one of the messengers to help spread that word. I'm hoping that our band can maintain and uh, hopefully have some more higher visibility and continue to produce quality music. The blues will go on. The blues will never die. Thank you very much, Billy. Thank you for brother. joining me today and for sharing your thoughts and uh, experiences. Thank you.